So in today's episode of Learning Unboxed, we have a very special treat because we're going to have a conversation about what happens when social enterprise meets education and opportunity. And joining us today is Nick Kafka. Um, and Nick is the chief executive and founder of an entity called Teach a Man to Fish, um, which uh, Nick founded after leaving a successful banking career in the city of London for a local microfinance institution in Paraguay, um, where he discovered an innovative school that was aiming not only to teach the poor how to become rural entrepreneurs, but also to do so in, as, as a self-financing social enterprise, which is super, super exciting for us to be able to talk about. Uh, with that experience, he helped transform the school, turn it into a replicable model, and then he went back to the UK where he founded teach a man to fish. So Nick, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So I always want to sort of start this conversation because our audience is global. They come to us from all over the world and, you know, very interested in these, these amazing stories of success in education. We hear all the time uh, that so much is not working. And although that's true in many cases, there are these amazing golden nuggets out there of extreme success. And they are nuggets that we should figure out how to capture, replicate if possible, and certainly implement in a variety of ways, which I suspect is part of what you discovered in Paraguay that you, you then came back to found this organization. So start with telling us what is Teach a Man to Fish? Okay, so Teach a Man to Fish is a uh, UK based nonprofit, uh, and our mission is to empower young people around the world with the skills they need for success in work and life and to make positive contributions to their communities. Um, so yeah, we started out in 2006 based off uh, some fascinating work uh, I saw in Paraguay and, and contributed towards, uh, and with a sensation that you know, there are, you know, sadly, the world is not lacking in innovations, but too many mm -hmm. innovations fail to, to scale up. Uh, so I thought, you know, I would do my part to see what I could do to take some of these uh, really interesting ideas about doing education differently uh, and making it much more relevant to the lives of young people so they would get more out of it and try and turn that into something more global and with greater scale. Um, and uh, yeah. That that's a that's a very lofty um, ambition and <laughs> absolutely worthy and I and I feel you because I I think so much of what we do at Pass and the Pass Foundation is very similar or at least like minded in terms of our premise. So, share with us a little bit before we get into the nuts and bolts of exactly what Teach Amanda Fish does. So, share with us a little bit about that experience in Paraguay and this the school and this idea because obviously it was it was very inspiring to you because you you didn't go back to to banking. You no. you came back and founded a nonprofit, and anybody who's involved in the nonprofit world knows that's that's an epic lift. No matter what the nonprofit does, it's not yeah. easy. So, you know, you are clearly inspired, or you would not have said, "Let me just take on some more." No, absolutely. I mean, I went from a banking background, and I was actually intending to do microfinance work when I went to mm -hmm. Paraguay. Um, but I realized, you know, that actually already the microfinance industry uh, was very well established then. But this was an interesting organization, Fundación Paraguaya, that was trying to apply some of the things that it had learned from microfinance to the world of education. And I guess one of the biggest takeaways they'd had over the years was just how vulnerable uh, you can be as a, as a nonprofit when you rely entirely on uh, donations exactly uh, that that yeah. means you don't control your own destiny so they mm -hmm. were looking for a way to make that school um they'd been donated a school because the a um religious organization that no longer had the means to support the school mm -hmm. uh, wanted to see it go to good hands for an organization they could trust uh, to pursue its social mission to ensure that uh, kids from the poorest backgrounds would still get an education but, but somehow the organization wanted to make this thing sustainable so they didn't have to rely on uh, donations. Um, and their great idea, I thought at the time and, and still do, was to try and make the thing pay for itself by uh, running a number of businesses within the school. But because it was a technical high school, they could really include the young people in this. Um, and through seeing and learning and experiencing business hands-on, uh, the kids would not just 
get their technical education, which is the, the main part of what was required by the government, but would actually get a very entrepreneurial education and would learn about how to make money through being part of a process that would enable the school to generate the funds to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, you know, A, the place was beautiful, and B, it had such a positive impact on the young people. You could see them coming in from, uh, you know, rural backgrounds where they would, uh, you know, have some of these sort of attitudes. They were constantly, you know, they wouldn't look people in the eye. They couldn't mm -hmm, speak with mm -hmm. much kind of confidence. Uh, and over the space of the three years of high school, they would blossom into young people who could speak confidently, look people in the eye and sell because part of what the skills, you know, one of the skills they worked mm -hmm. on in the school was actually selling to, to customers. Uh, and if you do that long enough, you can sell yourself, you can, you can yeah. sell your, your vision. And this is a transformation for them. So that, that left, uh, you know, a real impression on me in a sense that, you know, Paraguay isn't, uh, you know, one of these countries that mm -hmm. people sadly know very much about, and it would be very easy for that to exist as a sort of Island of excellence or hidden from the world. Uh, but, you know, one of the advantages uh, we have being based in places like the UK is the potential to reach out to a wider audience or right. access uh, different people. And I thought I could really uh, do something to sort of propel some of these ideas a bit more globally uh, if I set up something when I came back to the UK. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't tell you how much that really resonates because we see the exact same thing in the, the processes that happen with the kids that we work with and engage in that very applied hands-on, you know, the kids show up here at the past innovation lab, same sort of thing. They haven't had a lot of experience. They might not have engaged in much public speaking. They lack confidence. And again, you know, the, the not looking you in the eye, that is so, so incredibly familiar. And, and to your point, by giving kids these great, wonderful, robust experiences, their confidence grows and it's amazing the things that they can do. So um, I truly appreciate that, that element of all of this. So how does that then translate for when you went back to the UK, create Teach a Man to Fish? So fast forward to this moment, how did the experience in Paraguay and the sort of the journey since 2006 really sort of solidify your impact? Because right now, when I look at the list of things that your organization is doing, it's remarkable. So how do you get there? And what's the nuts and bolts of, of how do you make the decisions around what projects to do? Wow. Um, in the first instance, I wanted to know, you know, is there anyone else doing this kind of thing out there? You know, frankly, there are too many nonprofits in the world and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. many, many refuse to die when they, they probably should. So actually, the world doesn't need more nonprofits unless you've got something that's really distinct and no one else is doing it. We did a lot of research and really there was no one else trying to promote practical, skills-based, entrepreneurial education that would also involve mm. creating genuine income for schools. So uh, knowing that there was no one else there, out there doing it kind of propelled me. And uh, we just started, you know, from my kitchen table, like so many people do. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a, a volunteer who'd come along and helped me uh, for nothing. And we started making a bit of noise. We started pulling together organizations who had a similar outlook. We created a members network. We shared between ourselves and, uh, looked for that initial seed funding. And uh, you know, slowly, slowly, we, we started the first year, our income was like $3,000 and then maybe $50,000 <laughs> the next year. And uh, it's grown steadily over time. I think, you know, one of my co-collaborators in the early days, his message to me strongly was, you know, you've got to stick your bucket out there and then, mm -hmm. then it'll fill up. You know, if you're doing the right thing and you're capable of explaining to people what you're doing, then you will attract interest and opportunities from that. So uh, that's how we got started. We've always been sort of demand driven. So we, mm -hmm. we went places and we worked with people who sought us out and wanted to work with us rather than trying to you know, impose ourselves and decide where we wanted to work and persuade right. people they should do that. Um, and that sort of naturally grew, I guess, out of uh, English speaking at Africa, or mm -hmm. India, there was always a lot of interest. Uh, and then Latin America also because of our, our roots in, in Paraguay. Right. And, and to some degree, we've, we've stayed with those kind of geographies over time, although now we've added some more uh, programs which kids anywhere in the world can take part in. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of, you know, which projects we uh, 
we add on, we've yeah got, got a, our fingers in a lot of pies, but there's mm -hmm. a you know a common golden thread running through them. Uh, and I get one of the um, things we learned over time was that original model that we started with the the Paraguay model probably wasn't going to be the one that we could really take to mass scale because even though it was hugely impactful, which was brilliant, it was also very intense to run and did require a lot of startup funding, even though it was sustainable through its own resources once it got going. So one of our biggest uh, challenges was to turn that into something that was much more scalable. Uh, and once we had that, so this uh, program, the School Enterprise Challenge, I'll, I'll speak about a bit more later. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the main thing was just to really to, to scale that out, to get that known, to get as many uh, schools uh, involved as possible. Uh, and since then, we've selectively packaged that up in different ways to work with different audiences so that we can create even more impact. Yeah. So, so tell us, help our listeners understand then how exactly does it work? So what does, once a decision is made, we're going into X country or X community. So what is it? What's, what's the work that's happening? The roll up the sleeves, what's, what's Teach Amanda Fish actually doing with that partner school or community? Yeah. So it's, um, I guess the way things have evolved were from working very intensely with individual schools to wanting mm -hmm. to do a, a lot more in a country. Uh, so in the first instance, we were would have a single school perhaps that we were working with and really understanding their needs and uh, more about how, how it worked in a country. Mm -hmm. um, and often because of the nature of things, we'd end up starting with expats who would uh, understand the model because they'd spent time time with me or been mm -hmm. able to, to visit some of the uh, programs already going on somewhere else. But we rapidly uh, would transition to uh, local teams of local staff who understand their country and their culture in ways that, uh, you know, no outsider could. Um, and then it, really it's a question of um, raising awareness, mar marketing from our, our perspective, sharing with uh, schools that might be interested, the fact that this thing exists and explaining what it is. Uh, and as part of that process, obviously we try and collaborate as much with local government as possible. They already have those connections with schools and uh, come with a sort of unique credibility. So it, mm -hmm. when local governments could say to schools that, if this looks like a quality program, we'd be interested in you, you doing it. Schools would feel much more comfortable getting involved. And then uh, little by little, as we are able to, to raise some funds, put on teacher training workshops, the things would, uh, would build momentum. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, in certain countries in, in Uganda, I guess before the um, COVID, we were, were up to working with around two or 300 schools, wow. which is you know already quite a, a significant number if you, mm -hmm except you probably somewhere between sort of 40 and 100 kids in, the, in each school would be taking part in the program. So uh, yeah, around sort of 30,000 kids just in Uganda alone. Wow, that's remarkable and very, very impressive. So share with us a little bit about the School Enterprise Challenge. So that's that's really sort of a sweet spot, I guess, if, it, if, if you will, of where you've evolved to. So help us understand the ins and outs of that program. Yeah, so that's been very much sort of our flagship program. Mm -hmm. And it's structured as a, an awards program for schools. So schools can go through it year after year, progressing from bronze to silver to gold. But at the heart of it is the idea of planning and setting up a business which is led by young people and facilitated by, by teachers. So we have a 14-step a process uh, which starts with looking at the resources that are around you in a, in a community, identifying needs, uh, thinking about um, you know, what makes a, a great business and where the opportunities lie, and then going through business idea generation, business planning, creating that business plan. So there's a, a point of reference to look back mm -hmm. on, running a, a business, trying to make it as successful as possible, uh, and then every year they, uh, the students write up an annual report just like a regular business. Uh, but the difference is these reports get sent back to us and we get volunteer markers to go through them, provide feedback, 
uh, and there are prizes which uh, you know everybody enjoys as a sort of yeah. little extra incentive mm -hmm. or cher cherry on the cake. So uh, yeah, some of these schools can win uh, several thousand dollars, which in their context it can be a, a very transformative amount of money. Um, but yeah, you know, this this sense of competition and global mm -hmm. community creates an energy, and then that draws more schools into the program, and that's partly how it's grown over the over the years. And do these um, do these businesses that the kids create are they still intended, or is it just vary from location to location? I mean, do these businesses actually ultimately get get started, get founded, not just ideated, and then actually are contributing to the bottom line and sustainability of their schools, or is that just some of them do and some of them don't? Yeah. So so we're one of the things that we really push uh, uh, and uh, advocates for is the actual setting up of the business. So mm -hmm. if you look at all education programs out there, there's an awful lot of ones that are centered around the ideas and, and right. the planning. Um, and I, you know, I recently took part judging a competition like that. And it was amazing to see the ideas these kids mm -hmm. were coming out with. But I couldn't help feeling very few of them would be in a position to actually make that into a reality so uh, having a competition yeah, that's about dreaming is is great for creativity possibly not great for business skills right i think it's fundamental that a business gets set up and then they have to work out what do we do with the cash every day how do we keep the records on this right. thing how do we know if we're making any money or not and th this is the essence of um, business uh, and this is what trips up so many mm -hmm. sort of necessity entrepreneurs or very small scale entrepreneurs you know, around the world, wherever they are. Um, so that experience is is vital. But in terms of the scale, because, again, we believe it's really important for the sense of self-empowerment for people to start where they are. It would be kind of possible for us to raise funds and, and, and disperse seed funding that would get people off to a much faster start. Mm -hmm. But actually, the world doesn't work like that. For the young people, if they want to start something up, they're going to have to scrabble around and hustle to find yeah. some initial startup capital. They're not going to have a sort of angel from another country come and right. throw a lot of money at them. So often they have to start with what they can find. Often that's, you know, 10, 20, $30. You can't start a very large business that makes a big difference to your bottom line that way. Right. But the experience, the learning is still super powerful. So what we see is, you know, when they're in their first year and they're starting with uh, at a low level, the amounts of money are, are less significant, but frequently that grows over time. Again, one of the differences between what we're trying to do and many other sorts of programs that superficially sound a bit the same is that we're trying to really uh, enable a school and students to create something sustainable that has ongoing value in their school rather than a startup experience. Mm -hmm, you know, the mm -hmm. startup experience, you decide you're going to bake and sell some cakes, you sell them to your friends and family, you know, it's, it's still nice. You can learn things that, that way, but you can only get by so long selling cakes to your friends and family. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to find a wider audience. So um, some of them, after a few years, it, it becomes more significant. And, and recently, I was being told about a, a really nice school in, in Guinea, in, in Africa, and um, there, the way it works is that if you want to send your kids to secondary school, you don't just have to buy the school uniform, which already costs you money, like as a family, mm -hmm. you literally have to send them to school with a physical desk. Wow. Uh, and that desk is going to cost $27 or something. But $27 mm -hmm. is a lot to a, to a family. And that could be the difference between sending your kid or not sending your kid. So uh, the school there had set up its, uh, its own business, um, food related business and managed to generate about a thousand one thousand one hundred dollars which we work out as the equivalent of about sort of 43 desks so that's mm -hmm. 43 kids that could from poorer backgrounds go to that school who wouldn't have been able to before so it's you know in some ways it's not income on the scale of you know building giant new infrastructure sure. or transforming the school but for the possibilities if you're one of those 43 kids that's transformative for you uh, and uh, certainly money that the school it couldn't afford to stump up itself otherwise.
Yeah, life altering in the most positive yeah. of ways. Absolutely. That's phenomenal. So how do you I'm I'm super, super curious about because you're you're absolutely hundred percent. There are a lot of entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship programs all over the planet. And very few of them, I agree with you, very, very few of them actually go all the way to real implementation as opposed to just like you said, you know, a bake sale with your family or you know, doing some things with your friends, you know, great idea operation. So how do you, what, what is the support structure? I'm really, really curious about why and how it is that you're able to actually go from great idea to maybe even practice what the idea was to a true implementation. How do you, how do you do that? How, how is the support and I don't mean the monetary support. I mean, just, you know, a school or teachers, they're not necessarily going to know how to do that. So how do you, how do you facilitate that piece of the learning? Because that's the entire ecosystem learning. It's not just students and it's not just teachers. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right that, you know, one of the first challenges is the fact that teachers frequently know virtually mm -hmm. nothing uh, about running a business themselves. And because of the, the power dynamics in a lot of countries, he, it's teachers don't really appreciate being made vulnerable mm -hmm. to the idea that students will discover what they don't know. Um, so we emphasize in the first instance a lot on teacher training. We, ha we have to get the teachers understanding what the hell running a business uh, implies, why it's exciting for the students mm -hmm. uh, and why it's exciting for them. And much as uh, there can be a, a sort of sense that, that teachers are short on time and, and won't always you know, take on something that's extra if it's just for the for the kids. Actually, the reality is in so many countries, teachers are so badly paid and they have mm -hmm. no possibilities for, for pensions when they finish either. But many teachers try and have a business on the side or know that they would like to have a business so that they can generate enough money for themselves for a, for a pension. So uh, actually, teachers have quite a strong personal incentive to, to build their skills and to run a program like this as much for their own learning as for the kids. So between having super, having a very structured program that takes people in very, in micro steps through uh, all the different elements of learning that you might need in order to be successful, having lots of guides and videos that again, break it down into very manageable chunks. Uh, combining that with where we have presence in the country, there are, uh, trainers who will provide actual training sessions face-to-face mm -hmm. -face with teachers uh, and now we do a lot of webinars uh, for countries where where we don't have a presence we we make teachers feel a little calmer that they understand what's going on there are benefits for them you know it's worth giving it, it a go and, and then the fact that there are these uh, monetary prizes and mm -hmm. uh, non-cash prizes and, and the fact that there are reward levels so that the school can get recognition from an international organization, you know, so that makes the principals happy. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers are very happy if they're, they're winning personal prizes or, or prizes for the business. So we, we're just trying to align incentives. Uh, and I think that what, that's what makes the difference there. Uh, you know, often we, we hope that just because we put something out there, it will get adopted because it's good. Uh, and I think the sad reality is people don't just do stuff because it's good. Like we all know in our own private lives, we should adopt certain sorts of behavior that might be better mm -hmm. for us or healthier for us, but we still don't always do them because the, there's a barrier. But when you get the incentives right, you know, then, then you figure out how do you do that diet? Why, why do you start jogging every day? And, and this is the same kind of thing, but mm -hmm. in the realm of education. So is the is the program then very broadly available? So let's say you're not in Uganda. Let's say you are in the south of France or you're in the U.S. or you're in China. Um, it, it, is the program available broadly um, or accessible in such a way that all kinds of educational endeavors could choose to participate or opt in? Or is it or is it limited in the way you deploy it at this time? No, uh, yeah. So again, uh, that's one of the things I think makes us a bit distinctive. Often, only certain groups can participate in mm -hmm. the programs that are out there. But we're uh, super accessible if you have internet connection. I mean, that that's the sort of minimum right. requirement. So, schoolenterprisechallenge.org mm -hmm. uh, is the website. Anyone can sign up from 
any uh, country around the world, any educational level. So we have uh, obviously lots of secondary schools, lots of primary. Every once in a while, we get some pre-primary uh, mm. kids doing it. And it's amazing to see that even sort of four and five-year-olds, yeah. they, they, they can't do some of the more sophisticated finance stuff. They don't have to. But actually, right. it's it's about creating that sense of doing it mm-hmm. as a sort of creativity exercise problem solving they they still get a huge amount out yeah. of it so wherever you are in the world whatever educational level through our, our website you can participate you can watch the videos you can download the resources you can win the prizes you can be part of the community that's absolutely remarkable um, and i'm i'm super super hopeful actually that we have you know any number of listeners that are like hey i want to give that a try and we'll at least sort of dig into the concept of it and because you know i often talk about you know what past and guests that come here to sort of see what's going on you know the fact that i sort of liken what we do is sort of the intersection between you know a startup weekend and you know wicked serial entrepreneurship and a hackathon and and uh, an industry R&D prototyping team, right? All kind of rolled into one, right? Recognizing that each one of those different sort of enterprises has some really unique beneficial experiences and learning opportunities for the participants. And if you could sort of mesh many of these things together and combine it with a studio model or a portfolio model or an early college sort of opportunity for students to really sort of dig in and expand on the things that they're A, interested and intrigued by, um, but also their opportunity to see true success that, you know, students will engage and and always surprise you. And I would assume that through your journey, you've, you've had some remarkable surprises coming out of these schools and these students. Um, could you share one or two of those with our listeners? Because I people get jazzed by hearing, you know, those, those successes. The, and the flip side is I'll ask the same question afterwards about, you know, some of the, the constraints or disappointments that you've experienced. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the list of successes is, is, is extremely large. Uh, I get one of the things that is always um, interesting for us, uh, I guess, it, is that success at the, the sort of the, the local level or doesn't always involve the, or, or overwhelmingly doesn't involve the huge levels of innovation, actually, mm-hmm. because people need to operate within their their local environments they need to produce things that people already understand and and want to to buy actually that caps a little bit the uh, the the level of creativity because they're they're not coming up with a wild wild wonderfully new new things so an awful lot of the businesses that that uh, we see happen are agricultural based Mm -hmm. Uh, different forms of uh, making and processing food, uh, handicrafts, things that can be started up with relatively low income, but where there's a, a demand. Um, but there are, that that said, there, there are always sort of interesting sort of surprise ones. We had a uh, a um, queuing business in, uh, in Nepal, which uh, uh, I guess, you know, what, what in the US you kind of call a line, so actually, for many services, there would be uh, horrible kind of lines out there. Mm-hmm. So the, the the kids would recruit people to to go stand in line for other people who were waiting to to get to the front of the the line for the the bank or to pay bills or whatever, mm-hmm. and charge a small small amount for that and manage to turn that into a viable business. Wow. Or we had uh, <laughs> one, one one in Turkey where um, uh, the kids came up with sort of a, a, a discount card model and went around lots of local stores, persuading them to offer discounts mm-hmm. if people bought, bought the card. Uh, and that, again, was something uh, you know, more unusual for, for mm-hmm. the kinds of mm-hmm. kid-led businesses we, we see. But yeah, typ- typically they're not so high on the innovation stakes, but uh, but they make money and they actually get set up, which is uh, you know one of, one of the mm-hmm. most vital things for some learning to go on. 
Oh, absolutely. Kids learn so much in that space. That's just phenomenal. So what are some of the constraints that you've encountered? So let's say, you know, a, a, a school or, or a group hears about this. They think this is absolutely wonderful. But I also would assume that from time to time, folks get started, but then they just don't quite finish. And there's all kinds of reasons for that to happen. Life happens, you know, your local environment, your community, all those sorts of things. But is there anything that you see that is um, consistent when you sort of dig into why did you not complete that sort of turns up. I'm, I'm super, super curious about this because we sort of see this with all kinds of programming. Kids will get started, schools will get started, and then either the next great thing comes along and they get distracted and they just don't realize that the greatest learning hasn't happened yet because you haven't gotten far enough into the program to meet the moment where the aha happens for the participants. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that, sadly, that happens all, all too often. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we do a pretty good job of, uh, by hook or by crook, pulling, pulling people through the program. And, and what we do see is often there's a big drop off between registration and the, the next stage, which for us is submitting a, a business idea, mm -hmm. which is principally because people haven't really thought through just what the time commitment is. The, the biggest challenge, and I'm sure you hear that time and again, uh, for schools and teachers who already have a packed curriculum is how do they squeeze one more thing in? There aren't right. enough hours mm -hmm. in the day. If they do it after school, if they're not being paid for it, you know, that, that takes a lot of love from the, from the teacher. So uh, it, our programs are, are not easy. They involve uh, right. a bunch of work. They involve the work of understanding the thing in the first place, let alone actually doing <laughs> the thing. Um, and not everyone's up for that. Uh, yeah. So I think the, the biggest reason for dropouts is essentially not understanding or being able to sustain that that time commitment. The time commitment, uh, yeah. But, but, you know, partly why that's sad is because, you know, it, it is putting a heavy burden uh, on teachers, mm -hmm. um, but the real benefits are for the kids. So uh, when kids want to do it, if teachers don't want to do it, it still doesn't happen. Uh, and, and that's partly why we've been exploring more recently other ways of reaching out to young people directly so that if their teacher doesn't quite have the, the possibility because of their own schedule or the system to participate, that, that that still doesn't have to be a block on young people learning these valuable skills. So that gets us to, I assume what you're talking about is a 2020 program that you started working on, which is the Enterprise Adventure Program. So, so tell us about that and why that's different than the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly it. You know, we discovered uh, during uh, the uh, Corona crisis that as soon mm -hmm. as schools shut down, whether or not the teachers wanted to participate, there wasn't any real means for them to do that. Uh, some clever, brave ones were, were able <laughs> to sort of uh, continue doing some things via Zoom with their students, but that was the exception rather than, than the rule. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, rapidly thought, you know, how could we take that, the core of that program, what works about that, that program and put it into a format where young people could access it directly and it would be engaging. So we've styled this uh, as an adventure. You get to pick your superhero and gain your various superpowers of creativity and problem solving and uh, communication as you work through the various challenges or missions uh, related to starting up a business. Um, but doing it without a, a teacher's facilitation, we also took a few step back to, uh, to really make sure that young people would get a, uh, an opportunity to think about their own ambitions, mm -hmm. their own uh, motivations to really find that commitment from within to justify going all the way through through a program like that and uh, as it was our first uh, attempt at it you know that did, does only go up through the business planning process right um, but having done that you know a good number of the kids did go on and, and set up uh, enterprises themselves anyway but our, our challenge uh, this year in the coming years is to add on that sort of extra support to uh, to, to walk them through the next stages um, but the, it's really interesting you know the difference between working with young people directly and, and working with uh, teachers and groups mm -hmm. the uh, uh, one of the real upsides is that 
the young person gets to do exactly what they want to do. You know, there's nothing more frustrating in a group experience than you having a genius business idea, no one else seeing just how genius right. your idea was, and you have to, you know, put it on the back burner while you plow ahead with someone else's idea you don't necessarily entirely believe with believe in. So the the possibility to really, uh, you know follow your own best judgment and uh, spend more time on the things that excite you most, I think was uh, quite liberating for, for many of the kids who were involved in it. Um, but the flip side obviously is without working uh, in a team, you know, the, the teamwork skills, the leadership mm -hmm. skills that you think are really vital, both longer term running your own business, but also whether if you're going to be in employment, you know, the, these are things that employers value. So, um, Again, we're, we're trying to figure out now how we can bring some of that more into this uh, individual program. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be a great thing. I mean, I've seen some, some, some incubator programs that have figured out how to, how, to, how to bring teams together virtually. You know, so folks that, you know, pitching ideas and who wants to be part of, you know, my idea and sort of shuffle and trade. And so there's, you know, there's positives and negatives to those types of approaches, but I certainly appreciate that. I I always like to close the program, Nick, with, you know, asking a question about sort of what the future holds. So, you know, as you think about the fact that the world is coming around, hopefully on the flip side of this, this global disruption in the form of a pandemic, what's the next great thing for Teach a Man to Fish? Where, where do you see the, the next opportunity for the work that you're doing? I mean, I think there still is great opportunities on the ground in the countries where we work and particularly for reaching more disadvantaged mm -hmm. young people. Uh, that may be the only alternative. So recently we started working in, in refugee settlements in northern Uganda and there you know, the conditions are extremely basic mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so many child headed households, you know, desperate poverty and, and there's technology, you know, there isn't much in the way of... Right. Uh, cell phone coverage technology is not going to be the answer there so right. we're, 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 we're committed to continuing that kind of work but longer term I think the future is digital our programs mm -hmm. need to be better better online uh, and the the real excitement I think there is the the possibility for creating much more of a sense of community so whilst we've had even online programs already, it's a very, it's been a very hub and spoke. So we've had direct relationships with the schools who work their way through the programs, but the possibility of really trying to bring schools together and through the enterprise adventure, bring young people around the world together, I think has huge potential to, to generate more self-sustaining momentum, uh, really you know, we, we can feel, I can feel quite happy about the, the number of young people. You know, we say uh, around 370,000 young people mm -hmm. uh, we've reached in the, in the last sort of 10 odd years. Uh, but actually, th this needs to go to millions. And the only way to right. get the millions is going to be through, through technology. And it will only work through technology if it's compelling. And to be compelling, I think it needs to be social. And to be social needs this community aspect. So, uh, that's what we're going to be uh, putting a lot of effort into. And if we're successful in that, then, you know, actually it feels to me like there's a bit of a gap out there. You know, if you're yeah. a young change maker, if you want to change mm -hmm. the world, what's the big thing you can be part of? There are lots of local initiatives or some interesting platforms you can join, but where's the community of like-minded people? So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's mm -hmm. part of what we want to create is a community of like-minded change makers who are entrepreneurial and go out there and tackle some of these many issues that, we face locally, regionally, nationally, you know, the, the world is sadly full of problems. We need problem solvers. Oh, a worthy endeavor and ambition. Um, thank you, Nick, so much for um, spending time with us today and sharing the story of Teach a Man to Fish. And we certainly uh, applaud the work that you're doing and can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me.